drummingforlife.com. Hey there, it's Vaughn at drummingforlife.com. Aloha. Hope you're doing well. All right, so today we're going to dive deeper into the world of jazz comping on the drums. Now, I've done some videos already on my channel about jazz comping, and I'll put the links below in the description so you can go and check those out as well. Uh, what we're going to do today is a little bit different. Uh, I've got some music that I've got queued up. We're going to listen to it. We're going to watch some great players play, and uh, we're going to listen to that and first and just take a quick pass at it. Then we're going to go back and <clears throat> listen to it again, and I'm going to kind of tell you uh, what's going on in the music, all right? After that, I'm going to demonstrate to you some comping, some jazz comping with the same music and talk you through what it is I'm playing, all right? So I think this is going to help you really solidify in your mind, like, what is jazz comping and what do I play? When is it appropriate to play? Those kinds of things, and it's just in the context of real playing. Uh, I'm going to be using a video from my Brushes Mastery course, which is at uh, jazzdrumschool.com. And in the video, it features two wonderful, excellent uh, jazz musicians here in Japan that I play with a lot uh, Dr. Philip Strange on the piano and Tetsuro Aratama on bass. Uh, very, like, first call players uh, here in, uh, in Japan in the Kansai region, which is Kobe, Osaka, Kyoto. So uh, I think you're going to really enjoy it. So let's go ahead and, and, uh, and, and move over to that. And before we get there, just want to make sure you know you can subscribe to my channel if you like. Uh, and please go ahead and swish that like button and uh, leave a comment. I'd love to hear from you, and I do reply to all of my comments. Uh, so, I also want to mention that it, in my at Von Baron Music, uh, vonbarenstore.com, you can also get the drumless track for this particular uh, video, just the audio portion as well. Uh, so, let's go ahead and, and check it out. Uh, Okay, so you can hear there's a lot of really cool stuff going on. Uh, and this is from the video, the video practice track in the Brushes Mastery course that's called uh, Bell Town Avenue. And it's based on the jazz standard, If I Were a Bell. So uh, you've got lots of cool stuff happening here. Uh, one of the things I really love about playing with Phil, uh, the piano player, is he, is he really speaks on the, on the piano in sentences. So they're phrases, and I know that he's going to leave some space. And whenever somebody leaves space, it's an opportunity for somebody else in the band to kind of fill in that space with something that's related. So remember, with jazz comping, it's a, it's a conversation. We're like continuing a conversation with other musicians in the band. It's not a coordination exercise, and I know a lot of, there's a, there are a lot of exercises out there, and exercises I teach as well uh, about you know, jazz coordination. But... In the end, it's really about communication. And this is what I think uh, Phil does so well, is he leaves those spaces and he leaves an opportunity for the other band members to kind of fill in and, and, and be a participant in the conversation. So let's listen to it again, and I'm just gonna highlight a couple of things for you. Space. Some more space. Space again. Ah, a little kick there. Okay. 
internal space. Okay, so you see there's some space. Again, like I was telling you, there's this opportunity. Now, sometimes you're, you're going to play with players, and they're not going to leave that space. And so you're probably going to want to play less, because less is going to be better in that particular circumstance. Uh, let them just play. But in this case, Phil leaves a lot of great space. So now, let me go ahead and play. So I'm kind of playing along, right? And what I'm thinking about is, okay, there's some space. Now I can put something in there, something that's related to it. Not something that's, that's really different, you know, it's something that's going to be related to what he was saying before, uh, rhythmically that is. Uh, and, and there are times where I'm listening for the way he phrases and sometimes I, and I play with him so much that I know how he phrases and I know what, what he's kind of what he's going to do. So I sometimes can anticipate that and I can go along with his kicks. Now certainly this is a recorded track, so it's going to be the same every time. So it's actually a nice opportunity for you to learn his solo, okay, and then you can then interpret more with what in, in kind of interplay more with what he's doing. I call it creating musical counterpoint basically because you're creating, he's creating a line and you're creating a line, you're kind of putting them together. So uh, the bass is just walking straight through, so there's nothing to worry about there. It's really focusing in on that piano. Uh, and, and when you have that space, you know, there's, your, there's your opportunity to, to play something that, to contribute to that conversation. So while he's doing his, his playing as well, again, I'm listening for those rhythmic, kind of those rhythmic hooks, those rhythmic patterns that he's going to play that I can play along with. Oftentimes, one of the things that works really great, uh, and this is a, something I talk about uh, a lot, is the, 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 this really important accent in jazz, which is the third note of the, the triplet. And if you can think in terms of you know, playing like that, one, two, three, four, one, those kind of hits, on that third note of the triplet, one, those kind of hits are going to be really great a lot when you're doing jazz comping because jazz is really focused on those kind of particular accents. You can also focus on uh, playing kicks or playing some patterns on two and four. One, And if you mix that two and four in the ands, you're going to get some nice stuff. One, two, three. See? It's not so good to play on counts one and three. One, two, three. If we start focusing too much on counts one and three, then it loses that forward momentum and it actually is not going to be engaging with what the other musicians are playing because they're focused on that third note of the triplet and they're focused on counts two and four, right? They're not focused on anything else. So, uh, and I talk about this, uh, this uh, 
third note of the triplet in this most important accent in jazz in another video, and I'll, I'll put the link below for that as well. So, you know, you want to be thinking, like, what is the, the rhythmic language of the music you're playing? And in this particular language is jazz. And so we want to be focusing more on counts two and four and the, and the upbeats. Now, you can play sometimes on count one and three. That's fine. But you don't want it to be the focus. The focus really needs to be in that forward momentum, okay? And everything that you're going to play, if you, if you can hit things more often than not on the upbeats, on counts two and four, you're probably going to be pretty safe, actually. So let's do it again. Let's listen again, and I'm going to play again for you and give you another uh, rendition of how I might interpret his solo. more things I want to mention. Copycatting or Mickey Mousing is not a good idea too. So if he plays uh, a particular phrase, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to go, you know, doesn't really work so good. And the other thing is, is not, don't hit everything he does. So don't try to, don't try to anticipate everything the piano player or another instrumentalist, a sax player is going to play and try to hit all the, the kicks, the kind of implied kicks that they're going to be playing. That's just a little too much. That's like that's like kind of stomping on their creativity. It's good to do it sometimes. And you you'll know the more you play, you'll be able to identify, okay, these notes are important. I should I should kind of try to try to aim for these notes and do some kicks. And these notes, eh, just let him go. Let the piano player do what he wants to do. So yeah, there's kind of different ways that you can think about, uh, you know, what what to play and when, you know, when not to play, uh, kind of stuff. So I think that's also probably very helpful. Uh, let me do it one more time. One more point is that you don't want to overplay it. So if you you know you listen to the, the musician and how they're playing, and he's leaving lots of space, so there's no need to overplay it. There's no need to go at it and and play it like this. Uh, uh. Kind of like too much, yeah. Can you hear that? It's like 
kind of overpowering what he's trying to play. It's not really uh, allowing that space to kind of let things breathe and develop organically. So, you know, I think it's important that you also listen to solos and learn to sing the solos uh, and learn the language of jazz. This is going to help you immensely in your study of jazz. Uh, let's go back again one more time. I want to listen to it and I'm going to sing along the, with the piano solo. So baby do ya I'm not, my pitch isn't perfect, but the idea is I'm getting the, the, the phrase, right? So, and this is what I'm really focusing on, and this is probably the most important part of this lesson. I'm listening intently to everything he's playing, every note he's playing. I'm really listening to all of his phrasing. One thing I tell drummers a lot is don't listen to yourself, listen to everybody else. Then you understand what you need to play. And this is really key. If you can go back and sing his solo, for instance, you're going to act absolutely do two things. You're going to improve your jazz language, and the second thing you're going to do is you're going to know when it's appropriate to play something, right? Because if you don't listen to other people, you don't know what, what really is important for you to play, right? So when I'm on the gig, I'm not thinking at all about myself. I'm not thinking at all like, oh, I, I should, what's wrong with my left hand or, or what's the, what, what fill should I do here? That's for practice room stuff, right? When you're on the gig, you're playing with other people, you need to focus in on what they're doing and they're going to give you, from their playing, they're going to give you all the clues you need to play what you, what you really should be playing uh, in those particular musical contexts. So this kind of went a little deeper into you know, this kind of comping world. I hope it was helpful. And, uh, and you know, I just, just comping is just so much fun. Uh, and can be such an incredibly wonderful musical experience. And so I encourage you to, to you know, work on that and work on it. Really learn that jazz language. Think about those upbeats. Uh, think about the accenting on tune four. Uh, and uh, I didn't really talk a lot about the bass drum, but the bass drum and the snare drum do a lot of interaction uh, in comping and they're kind of like two different voices. And with the bass drum, you can also hit those, those counts on the upbeats and hit them on the two and four. So you can really treat the bass drum as an independent voice and the snare drum as an, indep as an independent voice and you can let them kind of interact with each other. It's a, a, a lot of fun. It actually adds a lot of uh, uh, kind of balance of, of low and high sound uh, to your comping as well. All right. Uh, so just a couple things. Uh, as I mentioned before, you can get this uh, particular video where you you could watch the video as a part of the uh, Brushes Mastery course at jazzdrumschool.com. And uh, it's, I have uh, uh, 22 practice tracks, uh, practice videos over there for you, uh, playing with these great, great musicians uh, to really help you, you know, cut your teeth. Get, really learn how to use your brushes in real musical contexts and, and play, you know, and prepare for playing on the bandstand. Uh, you can also get this particular this particular drumless track as just an audio track at vonbarenstore.com, and it's a part of the uh, Almost Jazz Standards Volume One Drumless Track Collection. So you can uh, check that out as well. Uh, I've got a great blog with lots of uh, great stuff about music business, about improving your drumming, and also about uh, drummer health. Uh, so you can check that out at vonbarenmusic.com. At, you can also sign up for private lessons. Uh, I just had one this morning. Uh, just, it, just really fun. I really enjoy, love teaching, have always loved teaching. And uh, I've got all these great camera angles. I didn't use so much of that this particular lesson, but you can see I've got all these camera angles. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, and uh, you can see 
close-ups of everything I'm doing, uh, which makes it really easy to, to learn. And I do it through Zoom, so you get your own video, and uh, and it's uh, you know it's a it's a great setup, and students are really enjoying it, and I'm having a ball too. So hope you'll check that out. You can sign up for those at vonbarenstore.com as well. All right. So thanks again for watching. I hope it was helpful, and as I always say, keep on drumming. Take care. Drumming for life. Dot com.